Hey guys, I'm Daisho, and I'm here bringing you some Hearthstone. I'm still a little bit sick, but anyway, I decided to play these games a little while ago when I was sick and I couldn't record. So this is going to be a post-game commentary, though this is the first time I'm watching it since I actually did record it. So you sort of get my first, second reactions. Anyway, um, additionally, I only have about 15 minutes, so this isn't going to be such a super long commentary right now. But yeah, um, I've actually played a bunch of arenas since this one, so I really should have done my research and uh, figured out what was in this deck and stuff. But yeah, this is a pretty garbage opening hand. I remember that this deck was, I think this deck was a little short in two drops. And uh, I think it was very short on three drops, but, but a little bit short on two drops. Fortunately, Paladin's hero ability is pretty good. It either can affect the board or demands they use their hero ability too, and if they're using their hero abilities on turn 2 and 3, like you are, then you can get your powerful 4 and 5 drops out, and if they're stuck with 2 and 1 drops in hand, then, you know, it's, uh, it's a problem. But instead of my opponent not doing anything, uh, not doing any things, not doing anything on turn 1 or 2, and uh, hopefully just um, using his shapeshift to get rid of my 1-1s, one -ones, he decides to play two creatures on turn 1. A Young Priestess and a Wisp. And uh, I think this is the first time I've seen Wisp cast against or with me. And for some reason he decides to take the 1 damage on the Wisp instead of his hero. Probably a mistake. When I say probably, I mean definitely. But fortunately... Um, what I said did happen. He did um, just trade his turn two with my shape, with um, his hero ability on turn two, with my hero ability on turn two. So that was really fortunate. And then on turn three, I just make another little guy. And again, I mean, he does demand an answer. My opponent has to hit it um, either with the wisp or with his, his shape shift, because otherwise, I'm going to be able to take out the young priestess, and that's obviously not going to be a beneficial situation for my opponent, but right now I'm thinking, all right, all I gotta do is hope that he overextends a little bit more, plays another thing, and it doesn't get buffed by the Young Priestess, or he just leaves my 1-1 uh, my one -one alive or something like that, and then I can go Consecration, and then even if I even I don't really need Consecration, I can still just go, like, Chill Wind Yeti next turn or whatever, and then the next turn I can, uh, I can Consecration, but here he decides to go work for a Mark of Nature, um, giving it plus four attack, which is almost never right unless you really need to trade with a bigger creature or it's going to kill them. But anyway, um, right here I've got a couple of options, but instead of needing to use Consecration, I can just Hammer of Wrath the Wisp for like a 3 for 1, and then trade off with the Young Priestess. So now we're basically on an even board state. He gets to go, he gets to play cards first, except I am up 2 cards on him. He's got 6 cards in hand, I've got 7, and I'm about to draw 1. Not only that, but he's just going to drop a Tauren Warrior here, which is a 2-3 on turn four, which is really unimpressive. I mean, when you think about Torin Warrior, sure, he's a little bit undercosted as a two, three for three, but when you're playing him on turn four without any other um, <clears throat> reason why, like you're not overloaded or anything, then he's just so much worse than anything that I can drop on turn four. I mean, I would have played a Chill and Yeti, which is uh, a total of nine power, four plus five, and his was a total of five power, two plus three. That's just so, so slow, um, so much weaker. Fortunately, though, I did have Stampede and Kodo. Kodo is one of the best um, guys, one of the best uh, creatures in this. And the fact that I was able to drop him here is awesome. So I decide to make this play, going for the Fen Creeper plus Argent Squire. I mean, at this point in the game, it's there's no there's not too much point in discussing my strategy because all I had to do was just play creatures every turn and I would win. Um, but instead of this play, instead of the Fen Creeper plus Argent Squire, I could have gone Chill and Yeti plus Hero Ability, and that's a little better for two reasons. Number one, it maximizes my mana. This this play also maximizes my mana. But number two, I get to use my Hero Ability. So um, if I didn't do this, then I would still have um, I would still have my Argent Squire in hand. But I won't be able to reuse that hero ability that I missed. So next turn I could do something like, um, I don't know, 
Mogishin Warden, Argent Squire, and Hero ability and maximize my mana at a future date. So basically the fact that um, the Argent Squire is a 1 mana which is easier to slip into a curve than 2 is also a reason. I don't know. I gave you a bunch of reasons and um, I couldn't really articulate exactly why, but basically um, the reasoning is because Argent Squire is easier to slip into a curve and you can only use one... Um, you can only use one hero ability per turn. So, um, using it as many turns as possible maximizes your value because you end up getting more creatures out of it in the long run. That being said, in this situation, I really didn't need to. Since I'm up by so much in this game already, he's going to have to pull off something miraculous if he wants to come back. And <clears throat> he keeps using his Doomsayer. Doomsayer is a really bad card. I mean, at the very best, it'll, like, gain you 7 life most of the time, but a lot of the time it just loses you value. I don't know, I guess, I mean, at the very best, you can trade, like, two for six or something like that, I don't know. But that's pretty rare. So he's gonna pick it back up and drop it again, along with a Goldshire Footman, so that's that's cute. And he's got a Wrath here for, um, <clears throat> for my Spellbreaker, so he's definitely doing some work, but, like, even just look at this board. He has three creatures on it, and I have four, but two of my creatures have already done work against him, and basically killed him. But yeah, right here, pretty easy play, I can just um, True Silver up, and then finish it off with Kodo. Um, I wanted to use Kodo in this situation, just because I wanted to keep both my creatures alive. A lot of the time you'll see me make plays like trade off a 2-2 two -two with a 3-2 instead of eating it with my 4-4 four -four because I want to keep it at a healthy life total so it doesn't get um, board, board swept. But in this kind of situation, the only thing that I really have to worry about is a swipe. I guess a Starfall too. This play is a lot worse against Starfall. But it doesn't really matter because um, <clears throat> even if he does swipe or Starfall or something like that, I'm still up on card so it doesn't matter. This Demolisher is just doing work for me. I was just going to hit it with my face, but then I drew the, uh, the Argent Protector, which just goes to show you that you shouldn't finalize any plans before you... <coughs> excuse me, before you actually make your decision on what you're going to do, because... Ta I mean, obviously it doesn't matter, but taking damage on my hero is, like, the only way that I could possibly lose this game, just going down to zero life or whatever. Um, well, I guess that's any game. But in this specific situation, losing more life makes me more likely to lose the game, whereas often you can use your life total as a resource. So even if you do go down in life total, you still won't <clears throat> you still won't die. But um, yeah, anyway, I, I got the kill here pretty easily. Making a 10-10 Frost Wolf Warlord is actually a pretty reasonable tactic as it stands. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you guys knew that, but... Turns out that that's, uh, that's how it works. So, got some sweet Demolisher hits in there. Probably didn't matter. I mean, I ended the game with four cards in hand to my opponents, too. So, even if he dealt with the six creatures that I had on board, he still would have had to deal with the uh, the card advantage that I had. Moving on to the next game. It's a Paladin Mirror here. And, uh, yeah, look at those three cards. Four cards. Really wanted all of those in my starting hand. Except, uh, no, I would rather have none of them in my starting hand. Any any time you have a 5-drop or more and you're not playing <clears throat> Druid with Innervates and Wild Ghosts and stuff, you don't really want to have 5-drops in your hand, in your starting hand. You almost never, I can't really think of any situation outside of Druid where you would even consider having a 5-drop, but managed, first of all, to pick up a couple of 2-drops and a 1-drop, but the Argent Protector is a little bit risky to coin, like, it's a little bit risky to coin out the Knife Juggler, because if he doesn't have a good 2-drop, then you kind of don't want to use the knife, the um, Argent Protector on turn 2. But fortunately, this game started out basically as good as it possibly could have, because not only do I get to play the Knife Juggler on turn 1, and um, get to kill the Amani Berserker basically for free, but I also get the random knife hit going to his face, which is pretty sweet. So now I have two creatures out, and my opponent's got nothing. And this is an interesting situation, because um, obviously my opponent's going to be on four mana next turn, so the thing that you have to play around most is um, Knife Juggler, or not Knife Juggler, Consecration. So by making this play, I get a better trade with my with my Argent Protector. I was really hoping that the Amani Berserker summon would hit the 
um, the 3-3. Three, three. But so I was really hoping to do that um, and then play around Consecration that way. But it didn't end up working out because I, I missed the hit on it. But even so, so my opponent could have Consecration last turn. It would have been okay though, not actually insane. Um, because he would have still taken 5 from the Imani Berserker. And then here, I have an int another interesting play. So I can just drop this um, Pint Size Summoner and hope to go ahead and, and kill the... Um, hope to hit the the taunter again but even so so basically making this play is a lot better than the first one because i'm pretty sure my opponent would have consecrated to uh clear my board the turn before if he had it but he had just drawn a fresh one so i do get three for one there i think maybe more like two for one two and a half for one because it was a like a one one plus an elven archer so yeah it was probably like a total of a of a three for one but that's okay because I do still get to play the first creature and now he's up to five cards in hand to my four so but it's gonna be my turn next turn so we're, we're basically about even on cards and uh, the fact that he's lost some life and I've got my three drop out there is are, are both pretty pretty decent things I mean they're not incredible so I've got a couple options here um, Kodo is an interesting one, but I mean, killing a 1 1 with Kodo isn't that great. I think in hindsight, a better play would have just been to um, play the. or. yeah, play the Twilight Drake and reinforce this turn. That way, I could get at least the 4 4 out of the Twilight Drake. Um, and, I mean, I still could get a 4 4 next turn, but it also like jumps into the curve pretty nicely and then getting something bigger than three power is good to have on the board in case he played like an x4 or something like that but here i'm i almost make a mistake i think but i end up figuring it out i want to play the twilight drake before i play the argent protector but i still use the protector to go ahead and keep my Kodo alive here and i mean it's not the best use of protector but it's also not the worst i mean it's always nice when you get to use the divine shield um, right away but basically what happened there is it gave my Kodo five extra health because now it's still a three five since it hit the Guardian King so when you get to do that with your Divine Shields that's awesome sometimes they only save one health and that really isn't so good but anyway my opponent continues the beats uh, or the hits I guess I don't know he keeps playing giant creatures and uh, it's a little bit scary but right here I have a couple of options eight mana so I can't play Hammer of Wrath and anything else other than um, hear ability and I decide and I mean I'm trying to decide if I want to keep my um, my Kodo alive or just play the Frost Wolf Warlord here and I decided to keep the Kodo alive and I think that was a good play because I ended up being able to drop the Razorfin Hunter here I mean it would have it, de it would have definitely been okay either way saving the Hammer of Wrath and losing the Kodo but getting what uh, I had three so it would have been four creatures so it would have been an 8-8 Frost Wolf Warlord. See, like, the the good thing about if if I was able to get the 8-8 Frost Wolf Warlord out last turn, then Taz Dingo would just not be much of a concern to me. But now I basically just have to um, lose the Argent Protector and... Or, or no, I guess... I decided to trade those three instead of just losing the Argent Protector and taking some damage on Kodo. And I think it's just to play around Consecration a little bit, because now he can just hit my Frostwolf Warlord, and then Consecration. Um, and then that would have also taken out my Kodo. But I don't, know, I don't know exactly why I did what I did. But now we're in an interesting position. Because um, if I just hit his Venture Co., then he just cleans up with the Bloodfin Raptor, and then I lose out on 9 damage. And generally, I do like to play it safe, but I think 9 damage is getting to the point where it's worth it to just go upstairs, especially because um, this is presenting lethal for my opponent next turn, so he's got to trade off and get rid of that Frost Wolf Warlord right now, and it'll get kind of a full 2 for 1. Not really, because the Venture Co. already took something out. So, um,. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not a great situation, but he's just going to Hammer of Wrath it here, which is an okay play, but um, it'll save his Bloodfin Raptor from dying to that, but that's not really that helpful, saving the Bloodfin Raptor, I mean. But he's got a Spellbreaker here for my Cairn, and then he's going to keep playing some more creatures, so he definitely has some stuff going on. 
and <laughs> keep drawing these Argent Protectors. And you, as you guys can see, when you're ahead or it's like a close game, Argent Protector is one of the best cards. Because when you can attack into their creature with an Argent Protector out, it is just outstanding. And at this point, um, it's not worth playing around at Quality Consecration because he only has one card in hand. So he would have to have one and draw the other one. Plus, a couple of turns ago, he had a really good opportunity to Consecration. Or, no, he didn't. Um, he almost did. So he didn't really have a great opportunity. But he had an okay opportunity. He could have taken out my Kodo and my uh, Frostful Forlord that one turn. But it wouldn't have been so good. Anyway, um, basically, I don't think that the card he has in hand is Equality or Consecration. So uh, playing around it is pretty good here. So he's just going to pick up his uh, Silver Hand Recruit. Honestly, <laughs> um, okay, so he, he had to do that to have exactly enough mana to play the Frostful Forlord. But um, what I was thinking is that I might just like take out a 1-1 with my... Uh, with my Bloodfin Raptor and then pick it back up, but either way, I have lethal on board, so I don't, I, yeah, I really don't know why he didn't just kill 1-1, one, one. he wouldn't, it would not have been lethal, I guess he just didn't do the math, but, um, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> it does happen sometimes where your opponents don't make such great plays, but I mean, especially with the, the new beta, or the open beta, rather, people are really new to the game so there's a lot of the time where they don't necessarily see the the game the way I do and it leads to mistakes and uh, some misplays so I think I'm gonna go through one more game right now and then that'll be it for today's video still a little sick so feeling the strain <clears throat> but uh, you know I'll push through it's not such a big deal so this one is against Rexar a hunter and I mean I am 4-0 with this deck which is something that I did not expect because I have I don't have enough two drops and of the two drops I have a lot of them are Argent Protector so you see me mulligan an Argent Protector here and that's because it's not really a two drop I I would rather just play hero ability than play a 2-2 two, two for two with no other ability so it's definitely a mid to late game kind of creature and uh, I don't want it in my starter hand it seems counterintuitive but it really kind of like Northshire Cleric you almost never want to play that guy in turn one because if they just follow it up with a 3-2 then you're in very bad shape in the same vein you don't really want to play your uh, your Argent Protector on turn two because it's a lot better when you can play it to help out a creature because a 2-2 two, two for two is unplayable but when you have this awesome ability which can just gain your creature five health or as we saw in the other game that happened then it's kind of worth it. But anyway, he drops a Shield Bearer here, and I can't say I'm that upset about that. I mean, Shield Bearer is not really a creature that is threatening outside of outside of Priest, I guess, where it's a little bit threatening if they've got Inner Fires or Divine Spirits and stuff like that. It can get a little scary. And I mean, sometimes if they have like a Master Swordsmith out and they can hide it behind a Shield Bearer, Shield Bearer's getting health, Master Swordsmith staying alive, or not health, gaining attack, and uh, you got yourself a nice little combo there, but for the most part, Shield Bear is not scary, and Knife Juggler is one of the best two drops to play against a Shield Bear because if I just Hero Ability next turn and I randomly hit the, uh, or at least either of his creatures at this point, then I can just take it out. And there's an Argent Protector, and that's a pretty good one here because a Divine Shield, it, while it won't be so good, it at least turns my Argent Protector into a 2-3 because it gave him one extra health because it didn't take a damage from the Silver Rap Patriarch. It's not exactly equal to one health, but it does the equivalent of that. So, I mean, it, it puts me in a pretty good spot here. And he's got a Thralmar Farseer here. And I guess he was hoping to be able to take out both my creatures, and that would have been a pretty reasonable play. He would have been able to gain the card advantage back that he lost on um, on, on the Silverback Patriarch dying. But I have, um, I have a Hammer of Wrath to just take that out, get myself a two-for-one, and then clear his board. So, again, at this point in the game... I'm at, he, my opponent didn't play anything aggressive early on. I managed to pick up a Knife Juggler and an Argent Protector to back it up. It's really just these games are very determined um, by um, if I can get a, an early Argent Protector to gain card advantage. And here I'm not going to be greedy. I know that in a couple of turns I probably could make a bigger Frostwolf Warlord. But at this point, a 6-6 six, six 
is just going to be so dominant. My opponent's got to have like arcane shot plus deadly shot or something like that. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to get so much advantage out of this card. I mean, I guess... Is it turn six for him? No, it's turn five for him. So he still... Can oh, has he used the coin? He might not have used the coin yet. Maybe he did on turn two to play the Silverback Patriarch. I can't remember. I think so, actually. But either way, he can't drop a Savannah High Main just yet. Which would be pretty threatening to my Frostwolf Warlord. And could be an argument for why I should have... Um, waited on the Frost Wolf Warlord, but for now he's just gonna play a Hunter's Mark and a Steady Shot, and then be really disappointed with the rest of his turn because um, I can just add a lot of power to the board. So I could have I could have just dropped an Archmage, but I decided to um, use Hero Ability. Same thing that I was talking about earlier. The more Hero Abilities you use, the more advantage you get out of your turn because uh, it's something it's an extra resource that you can use that you wouldn't have been able to use because you can only do it once per turn. So like. In games, in control mirrors, it becomes very important to use your hero ability once every turn. In this spot, <laughs> I'm playing against a hunter, and he just dropped an Unleash the Hounds. And that is definitely a reason for why I should not have used my hero ability last turn. I definitely, like, it's definitely a consideration. If he had had a Starving Buzzard here, then it would have just completely ended the game. As it stands, it puts me in a bad spot. Um, he used the Hunter's Mark last turn. I don't know why he should have just waited on it, and it definitely would not have even made me suspect Unleash the Hounds, but <clears throat> at this point, he can um, do a couple of things. Honestly, if I'm in his position, I'm just taking out the Knife Juggler with two of my guys and then eating the 1-1 one, one with the 3-3 three, three, or maybe just hitting me in the face. Like Either play is, is fine, and neither really matters, but even after this Unleash the Hounds plus Houndmaster... I'm still reasonably far ahead, not extremely far ahead, but I mean, I still have this Chillwind Yeti that he's got to deal with, and I still have some other, um, or I still have more cards in hand than he does, but he decided to do exactly as I suggested, and uh, yeah, that puts him in a pretty good spot here, <laughs> though I could just go ahead and drop a Fen Creeper or a Mogishin Warden. Probably gonna go for the Fen Creeper because it maximizes my mana. And now I'm thinking whether or not I even want a hero ability just in case he's got another Unleash the Hounds. But I still decide to go for it. Maybe misguided, maybe not. But it's uh, it's how I play it because like even three one ones here isn't so such a big deal unless he has a Timberwolf and he probably would have played the Timberwolf last turn if he had one. Though to be honest, my board was a lot weaker or like was pretty weak to just unleash the hounds he didn't really need the timberwolf but anyway and also he had the hound master that he wanted to play so he maximized his mana the turn before but definitely a scary situation and something that you have to think about like when you're playing as mage you have to think about all right turn seven flame strike but at every stage of the game since Unleash the Hounds only costs two mana. You have to think, all right, well, do I really want to play this third creature? Do I really want to play this extra 1-1 one -one for the marginal advantage? Or would I rather just have my opponent not get an extra Hound when he um, drops his Unleash the Hounds? But anyway, he's going to drop a Savannah High Main here. And that's pretty scary. <laughs> I mean, obviously a very, very powerful card. And uh, in this situation is troublesome. So I've got a couple options here. So I can either trade that Chillwind Yeti or um, I can use the True Silver Champion. Unfortunately, I'm missing one power, I guess. So like, if I had an extra 1-1 one -one right here, I could just run my face and a 1-1 one -one into his Savannah High Main, and then um, another 1-1 one -one into his Houndmaster, and then Consecration. That would have been a really sweet play. But unfortunately, in this kind of spot, I had to... Um, I had to just go for that, and I, I made sure that I didn't have lethal, I was too short, because I could have hit him for four and then another one damage, so I could have taken him down to two here, um, but not much else I could have done about it, in terms of killing him, because I don't have Steady Shot as my hero ability. But, I mean, after these two plays, I'm definitely a lot more scared of my opponent, I'm still up, I have seven cards to my opponent's five, and Ravenholt Assassin is not really a winning card right here, but... It could have been a situation where my opponent came back and was able to win. It would have been a little convoluted, especially since I had the Fen Creeper. 
but I mean, I've won game. I mean, I've lost games to Hunter where I just end up screwing up like that, and just not playing perfectly down the road, down the stretch. But anyway, I'm 5-0 to start this um, arena run. So thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll show you the the, uh, the next game in the next video. Have a wonderful day. Bye.